Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the US dollar Japanese yen cross, the five minute chart. And you can see here that on the open, we got a huge ramp in the dollar versus the Japanese yen. And then we got a big smackdown in silver. So we, we changed from having the the euro act as the uh, smackdown mechanism and we went to them using the uh, yen that's par for the course but i want to show you an interesting uh, perspective here when we go out to the weekly now if you remember i mentioned to you about the period that was fukushima and that was right there and then of course we had the re-election of barack obama from that point on literally almost to the day we've we've seen this utter destruction of the japanese yen which continues to this day now i've argued before i'm not going to go into the details of it that uh, modern keynesian economists tell you that a currency going down is good for the country that's gobbledygook and nonsense um was it good for zimbabwe of course not so but what is behind this well what's interesting about this is if you look at the overlay of silver with the japanese yen um, the pattern is is fairly startling you can see that silver is in a long uptrend it's only just now below the general trend line uh, but has been in a very long uptrend all the way back to the 90s you can see from that same point in time the Japanese yen was in a uptrend. In other words, it, this chart going down is the US dollar declining against the yen. So the yen, at the same time that silver and gold were going up, the yen was getting stronger. Um, but it is, it, it is at this point here where we get uh, just a complete change in the situation. Uh, we've got the top in silver and uh, we've got the just a demolition of the Japanese economy. Now, I'm not going to make this the topic of tonight's update. I'll have to research it further and give you another update on this because I, I have to go back and, and get into the news stories and stuff. But if you remember the um, stories about Japan and China coming out back here in this time period before Fukushima and the Japanese yen being destroyed. Uh, there was some issues about the islands, if you remember, but there were also other issues about them coming together. In fact, they had started to sign some trade agreements. And if you think about that, and again, we'll have to do a whole nother video on this. Strategically, it is critical for the United States to prevent Japan allying with China economically or even militarily. Uh, which would be a, a natural thing for for countries that are in that area, including with the issues that we're seeing with the South China Sea right now. It, it makes perfect strategic sense for these Asian countries, which are similar culturally, geographically, economically, in many ways, uh, aligning together in an alliance. That, I believe, is, is what is behind this. But uh, we want to get on to the main topic of the night. This is going to be social insecurity and it starts with this video that uh, came out recently. It's caused a lot of controversy. And this is called Paying for the Past. And this is the uh, Pete G. Peterson Fiscal Summit. And uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that in a second. But I want you to... Now, the panelists here are Alan Greenspan and Lawrence Lindsay and Richard Fisher. So these are all Federal Reserve people. Uh, as we'll see, these are also all members of one big cabal. Now, they, they want you to think that they're different sides in this thing, but this is just a Hegelian phony dialectic. These people are all on the same side, and they're all up to the same thing. But we're going we're gonna to zero in on the incredible hypocrisy and lies about Social Security, and, and then we're going to expose Pete G. Peterson and this foundation supposedly conservative foundation. So let's listen here. It's going to start with um, with uh, Lawrence Lindsay, and then we're going to hear Greenspan. Yeah, so, and that's why I don't think we appreciate the urgency. 
Under President Obama, the OASDI, the Social Security Trust Fund, actually ran cash flow negative for three years. That means we're starting to run down those balances already. We will exhaust the trust fund sometime in the late 2020s. That's not too far from now. 85 or 90 percent of the people in this room will be alive when the Social Security Trust Fund does not have enough money to pay its obligations. So that's an issue we all have to confront. It is coming, it is coming soon, and it is not being discussed. I personally don't think it would be prudent in 2027, or not only not politically possible, but not even economically sensible, to do what the current law says, which is simply cut all Social Security recipients' benefits by 27 percent across the board, okay. in part because I'll be one of those recipients. <laughs> but um, but, but it, it doesn't make political sense. It really doesn't make it isn't it isn't fair. That's why we have to begin now with a gradual phase down. So you do not face that kind of shock. The fact that we're not going to be having an across the board cut means those are as real a source of debt as our bonds. And if you include our unfunded Social Security and Medicare obligations, our debt is actually much closer to 300% of GDP mm -hmm. and not to 100% of GDP. That, by the way, is higher than Greece's debt currently. Now, let me go on from there. The notion that we have a trust fund is nonsense. That trust fund has no meaning whatsoever except for the fact, as in all private defined benefit programs, if it runs out of money, you can only pay out the cash flows mm -hmm. that come in, as Larry was pointing out. But the probability that that will happen is not particularly high, like start, let's start with zero and go down. Uh, that means that the trust fund is a meaningless instrument. It has no function, and I think as Larry pointed out, it's exactly the same thing as uh, current expenses. I mean, it's not, it's a discretionary, it's, it's, a, it's a mandatory outlay, and the existence of the trust fund and all the discussion about when it's gonna run out, it's nonsense. There's no possibility that when it runs out that uh, anything's gonna happen, except they'll change okay. the law, or move some general revenues, which is what they usually do, into, it. into the yeah. trust fund. It's just, there's a bunch of bookkeeping stuff that goes on, which has no meaning. Okay, now I'm going to use some strong language because th this makes me angry. This filthy scumbag, I'll call him Alan Greenspan, I'll, I'll show you why I'm so angry about this. This is the man who caused this. Uh, this is an article from a kind of liberal leaning, so ignore the, you know, uh, liberal nonsense in here. But historically, most of this information is correct. It was Alan Greenspan who looted the Social Security Fund. Um, now, it should have been. Uh, now, uh, what they love to talk about now is how Social Security is an entitlement. No, it's not an entitlement. It wasn't supposed to be an entitlement. It was It's a forced investment scheme that you don't have any choice in. You're forced to participate in. But what happened was, uh, whereas they had the fund was invested in treasuries, which, of course, it shouldn't have ever been in treasuries. It should have been invested as the CAFRs are. Remember the CAFRs? All the government people, they have their money invested in corporations. They could have invested the Social Security funds in stocks or in corporations, but at least... Uh, even if those had not performed so well, they wouldn't have been able to just simply make a bookkeeping change. But who was behind all that? Yes, that's right. This scumbag, Alan Greenspan, was the one that did it. Ronald Reagan was one of the most popular presidents in modern history. As a former actor, he had an uncommon degree of charisma. The conservatives absolutely loved Ronald Reagan for his efforts to reduce the size of government, but most liberals hated him with a passion. Reagan is still revered by a lot of Americans. This reverence for Ronald Reagan helps to explain why he was able to fool most of the American people to a degree unparalleled, unparalleled by any modern president. 
With the help of Alan Greenspan, Reagan pulled off one of the largest, greatest frauds ever perpetrated against the American people. It is so ironic that many people today believe, still believe that Ronald Reagan came galloping up on a great white horse to sound the alarm that Social Security was in deep financial trouble. He then allegedly figured out a solution to the problem and rammed his legislative proposal through Congress in a three-month period. On April 20, 1983, the signing ceremony for the new legislation took place with great fanfare, below were some of Reagan's remarks at the signing ceremony. And we're going to skip those and get into the history of it. Instead of being a proud day for America, April 20th, 1983 has become a day of shame. The Social Security Amendments of 1983 laid the foundation for 30 years of federal embezzlement of Social Security money in order to use the money to pay for wars, tax cuts, and other government programs. The payroll tax hike of 1983 generated a total of $2.7 trillion dollars in surplus Social Security revenue. This surplus revenue was supposed to be saved and invested in marketable U.S. Treasury bonds that would be held in the trust fund until the baby boomers began to retire in 2010. But not one dime of that money went to Social Security. The 1983 legislation was sold to the public and to the Congress as a long-term fix for Social Security. The payroll tax hike was designed to generate large Social Security surpluses for 30 years, which would be set aside to cover the increased cost of paying benefits when the boomers retired. Let's have a look at the events leading up to this proposal. Reagan and the government had big financial problems. Supply-side economics, and they're going into Stockman and this stuff. I'm not going to go into this. This is the liberal spin on it. The mechanism which allowed the government to transfer $2.7 trillion from the Social Security Fund to the General Fund over a 30-year period was the brainchild of President Ronald Reagan and his advisors, especially Alan Greenspan. Greenspan played a key role in convincing Congress and the public to support a hike in the payroll tax. A few years later, Reagan appointed Greenspan to become chairman of the Federal Reserve System. Since Greenspan's new job was one of the most coveted positions in Washington, many observers have wondered whether or not this appointment represented, at least in part, payback for the role that Greenspan had played in making vast sums of new revenue available to the government. President Reagan and his advisors knew from the very beginning that the government would soon face a severe cash shortage. Reagan needed a new source of revenue to replace the revenue loss as a result, and this is the liberal spin, unaffordable tax cuts. Well, again, you know, that's the spin. We, you don't need, tax cuts aren't unaffordable if you just simply cut spending more. He was about to rescind any of his income tax cuts, but he had another idea. What about raising the payroll tax and channeling the new revenue into the general fund? Okay, and that's exactly what they did. Social Security was not definitely teetering on the edge of bankruptcy in 1981, as Reagan claimed in his letter to congressional leaders. The 1983 National Commission on Social Security Reform, headed by Alan Greenspan, issued its findings and recommendations in 1983. The commission accurately foresaw major problems for Social Security when the baby boomers began to retire in about 2010, but that was nearly two decades down the road. And it goes on. Reagan's scare tactics worked. Ray Congress passed the Social Security Amendments of 1983, which included a hefty increase in the payroll tax. The tax increase was designed to generate large Social Security surpluses for the next 30 years. The public was led to believe that the surplus money would be saved and invested in marketable U.S. Treasury bonds, which could later be resold to raise cash with which to pay benefits to the boomers. But that didn't happen. The money was all deposited directly into the general fund and used for non-Social Security purposes. Reagan spent every dime of the surplus Social Security revenue, which came in during his presidency on general government operations. His successor, George H. W. Bush, used the surplus money as a giant slush fund, and both Bill Clinton and George W. Bush looted and spent all of the Social Security surplus revenue that flowed in during their presidencies, and of course, Barack Obama as well so and it goes on uh, again that's a liberal perspective on it but a lot of those are the real facts so think about the irony of this this man who his job what he was hired to do 
was to con the American public and Congress into increasing payroll taxes and then making it so that money could go into the general fund. He was the one that was behind that. So that, to me, that, that makes me very upset uh, that they would pull a scam like that. Now, let's look at this organization, the PGP. You can see the PGP Foundation, the Pete Peterson Foundation. Now, who is Pete Peterson? Well, you can see here, Pete Peterson is just another one of the cabal. Peter George Peterson is an American businessman, investment banker, fiscal conservative, philanthropist, and author who served as the United States Secretary of Commerce from February 29th, 1972 to February 1st, 1973. He's also the founder and principal funder of the Pete G. Peterson Foundation, which he established in 2008 with a billion dollar endowment. The group focuses on raising public awareness about U.S. fiscal sustainability issues related to federal deficits, entitlement programs, and tax policies. In recognition of his support, the influential Peterson Institute for International Economics was named in his honor in 2006. Before serving as Secretary of Commerce, Peterson was chairman and CEO of Ben and Howell from 63 to 71. From 73 to 84, he was chairman and CEO of Lehman Brothers. In 1985, he co-founded the private equity firm, The Blackstone Group, which went public in 2007. Peterson was chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations until retiring in 2007 after being named chairman emeritus. In 2008, Peterson was ranked 149th on the Forbes 400 Richest Americans with a net worth of $2.8 billion. So here's a guy who comes out of government, Secretary of Commerce, and then he's a billionaire. And you can see Gates, Buffett, here's the usual crew. So here again, this is their Hegelian dialectic. These people, as George Carlin says, it's one big club and you ain't in it, but they are all in it together. The fake left and the fake right, they're all in it to bankrupt the country and steal everyone's retirement. That's what's going on. That's what they're getting ready to do. Now let's look further into this this uh, Pete G. Peterson uh, Foundation. I've got another video here. Uh, actually, before we play this, let's look at the people in the summit. Here's the, the summit where this occurred. Uh, the, the one video hit Zero Hedge and everybody got worked up about it because they're admitting the truth. Well, they're the ones behind it. It's just an indication. It should be an indication that they're about to do something about it. But let's look at these wonderful people at the Pete G. Peterson Foundation Summit. We've got Michael Bloomberg. I'm not even going to comment on him. Uh, we've got Douglas Elmdorf. These are government people. Josh Bivens, uh, Joshua Bolton, uh, Andrew Card, White House Chief of Staff, Here's uh, U.S. Department and Housing and Urban Development. Wow, what a creepy looking guy. Um, William Daly, uh, Argentier Capital. Here's Richard Fisher that was on the panel. Here's the CEO for A New American Century, former Undersecretary for Defense Policy, Michelle Flournoy. What a crew. Alan Greenspan, Jason Grumlet. So you can see uh, bipartisan. Now, this, so this is the conservative, right? This is the fiscally constrained, fiscal restraint side of their little um, fake system that they have here. Let's, let's listen to a little bit of this from the, cons the quote-unquote conservative uh, side. If we were to invest uh, in the skills of our labor force and improving our infrastructure and do it in a fiscally responsible way so that we're not uh, escalating our debt, the future would be quite golden. We'd see kids from low-income backgrounds regularly reaching solid middle-class jobs, dynamic cities with a lot of innovation, uh, lots of access for kids from lower income backgrounds to move up in the income distribution. And if we were able to replicate that throughout the United States, you'd have a country where a child growing up anywhere in the U.S. would have a shot of becoming an inventor or a doctor or uh, a contributor to society in an important way. We have a So, 
basically these guys are all a bunch of communists. If you listen to what they're saying, they use the term invest. Uh, that's ridiculous nonsense. Uh, governments don't invest. Uh, they just change the meaning of words. Basically, these people are all communists and socialists. It doesn't matter if they're on the right or the left. They're moving us down that road to central planning, complete government control, and both sides, the right and the left, are going that direction full speed. So that that was absolutely shocking to me to see Alan Greenspan be the one who comes out and says that, well, yeah, there really isn't a trust fund. I mean, everybody knew that, right? When he was the one that did it, it's just, it's shocking and maddening. And now they're going to take away the Social Security money, the entitlements, the money that you put in. They're going to steal that too because they're planning on stealing everything. And that's why we have to be very vigilant about the ways of getting out of their system and not relying on their system. I don't rely on my Social Security. I had to cut a big check this year for for Social Security. They tried to say, uh, I just sent them a check. There's no fighting those people. But uh, this money, we can't count on. It's not going to be there. I mean, you might be lucky and maybe you'll get some. Uh, Maybe you'll get some dollars that uh, don't really buy anything. Who knows? It's not something that should even be in the equation. I'm not looking at it in my equation, and uh, I don't think many of you are either. Uh, We just have to keep an eye on silver, and it is getting very cheap right now. I am not anywhere near pulling the trigger at this point. Uh, I'm looking to see normally what gets me to pull the trigger on silver is a big, huge illiquid smash down that always seems to be the bottom I'm not seeing that yet but we're definitely keeping an eye on it for a big move down maybe a retest of this or something to see if we can pick up some more cheap silver and we'll talk to you next time